guide up for this week on public as usual. And it will also be up on the website once we're done with all this, all these shenanigans. Um, so there should there's one called uh, TSK4 out in there. Some of you guys have been like playing around with LEDs and like annoying Brian's story and, and like making blinking things and that's good. Mainly you. Those purple LEDs are pretty sweet. Um, today we will be talking about how to control things with your Arduino that are bigger than your Arduino. So you can imagine that if you have like a 9 volt motor and your Arduino can only supply. 5 volts and like 20 micro, sorry, milliamps. You know, that motor is not really going to be doing much when you connect your Arduino, you run the pin high, right? It's going to be like a snail. Or like, a little really slow. Um, so sometimes you'd like to control larger things with your microcontroller. Your microcontroller is small, that's why it's a microcontroller and not like a you know, macro controller or just a regular controller. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, microcontrollers are designed to be low power, so you can get, you know, a lot of operations that have not very much power to save things like battery life. So it does make sense that they don't draw too much power, they don't save resource for much power. Um, so do you guys all get the guide okay? Alright, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about interrupts and how those can be used for encoders, and then why we won't be using those for uh, Riva bots, even though I'd like to, because we are limitations that come with the fact that everyone gets an arena that costs probably $5. Um, and then we'll build the chassis, and next week we'll use what we learned this week, along with the, uh, the chassis to like, actually hook up some motors and nice things. And so next week, We'll probably actually be in, in uh, let's see, next week is spring break, yes? So I will be here this next weekend, and I'll be here the weekend after that. Well, I'm going to assume you guys won't be here the weekend after that. We'll probably be like, you know, frolicking around in California or somewhere. So, you'll be here. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll we sort of have this two-week hiatus. When we come back, we'll do a quick review of what we talked about today. Uh, and then we'll actually hook these up to things. Um, depending on how everyone feels about it, I could easily just tell you guys things to do, and you guys can try them out um, over break, kind of. But I would rather actually run this for six weeks, because I said I would. So. Maybe we'll have some emails about that. Um, but so today, sort of the order is like more things about microcontrollers, how to control big things, how we could control big things if our Arduinos were nice, slash if we wanted to do something that's a little bit of a pain. And then we'll build these things. That'll take a long time. So we'll go through this quickly. So the first thing I want to talk about today are controlling big things. Um, so does anyone have ideas of what big things might be other than motors? Bigger motors. Bigger motors. Yeah, got your control face on. Um, <laughs> what about lights, right? Like maybe you want your Arduino to control like the lighting in your room or your projector, right? Maybe you want to be able to walk in here and be like, Arduino, turn on lights, right? And I have some sort of thing that processes that and turns on all the lights. Or maybe I, I have like an incubator, right, and I want to turn on and off some sort of like heating element. The heating element is, you know, probably not going to run like 
five volts, you know, yeah. 20 milliamps. Um, or maybe I have something like some sort of pneumatic actuator that is controlled by like some huge voltage, right? There are a lot of things. Or maybe I just want to have a huge voltage to like create a magnetic pulse for blow. There are lots of things that you may want to control that are quite a bit larger than your you know, actually sacred source power. Um, or your bike, you know, your generic microcontroller can source. A, if you're lucky enough, will uh, current kill an LED, but it has to be a pretty weak LED. So basically, all the pins are really good for lighting up LEDs or sending signals to other things. So I don't have any ideas what this thing might be. You can send signals to transistors. Transistors. MOSFETs. Offense. Op amps, transducers, transducers. What is this? I'm just, I'm just repeating what you guys are saying. Yeah. Um, so you, you might send it to a transducer, and we'll talk about one system where you sort of do that. And you can send them to MOSFETs, which are metal oxide, MOS, little oxide something, something sort of field, silicon field effect transistors, which are just another kind of transistor that we'll talk about because they're more magical than PJTs. We'll talk about right now. Um, yeah, so that, those are some of the things. And then, sort of the other one, which you guys may not have heard as much about. Oh, also op amps. Op amps, so you can definitely send signals to and turn things on and off of those. Those are sort of, they're good for buffer. Um, but the other one, the other one that we'll talk about uh, is the relay. Relays are exactly what they sound like. Um, so, transistors. If everyone wants to open up the guy, you'll see this. Cool picture. Actually, let me just. <coughs> this picture. Whoa, it's this. This is an H bridge. So we'll be introducing the transistors kind of a switch, um, which is what we will actually be using for. So an H bridge is a motor controller. Anyone guess why it's called an H bridge? Could it be because it's shaped like an H? Probably a bridge. Probably not. And it's a bridge. And it's a bridge. Right. So this is the transistor sort of diagram for an H bridge. But if we scroll down, we'll see this sweet switch diagram. And you can sort of answer some things I'll ask you. Um, but you can imagine that if we connected this switch and this switch, we'd have a short circuit and nothing interesting would happen to the motor. We connected this one and this one. We have another short circuit. Nothing interesting would happen. Um, but if we connected switch three and switch two, we would have a current that goes do 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 do, flows around here, goes through the motor, and then back into the sort of voltage source or current source thing voltage uh, here. Right. And so that's one way across the motor. Does anyone know what happens if you switch the way that voltage is applied to a DC motor? So it happens. Okay. It switches direction. Right. And this is handy because you might want your motor to do something like go forwards and then go backwards as if it were connected to some sort of robot or car, right? Car goes forwards, car goes backwards. This would be really useful. Um, and so this is what an H-bridge is, and it's really a pretty awesome device. They're cheap enough that we all, instead of like, instead of building one, we got you guys these nifty, uh, H bridges. H bridges are cool. Um, yeah, so we'll be using those. Uh, here we go. We got there. Um, and so this is sort of the transistor view. So you can actually get these DJTs, these bi uh, bipolar junction transistors, which are this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. Just like resistors are normally called like R1, R2, these are called Q1, Q2, uh, etc. And you'll notice we have two types here. We have an NPN and a PNP. Do you know the difference? Um, the NPN will be off with the same signal that turns on the PNP. I know. Okay. The emitter are swapped. Yeah, so the, the, the way these work is that the PNP will turn on if the base is lower than the emitter. So 
they have three sort of leads, one of them in BJTs are called the emitter, the base, and the collector. And it's silly because sometimes the emitter Yeah, it perhaps needs, but like it's not coming out. <laughs> Alright, it's gone now. Awesome. So we have the emitter, the base, and the collector, right? And sometimes it's sort of weird the way that they go, because you think the emitter would be like emitting e electrons out, right? Like pew, right? And the collector would be like where the electrons come in, but that's definitely not the case. So if you look at Q4, which is a PNP transistor, um, the emitter is connected to power and the collector is connected to sort of where the power would go or not go. And so the way a PNP works is that if the base is lower than the emitter, it will turn off. So it makes sense that we have it connected to the sort of like power voltage because um, if we couldn't pull it low compared to that, then we'd be in trouble, right? Because then it would just always be on. Um, and you'll see, so the NPM works the other way. If the base is higher than the emitter, then, it, then that one turns off. So these ones have to be sort of connected to ground on the emitter side, and the other ones are generally connected to power on the emitter side. Those are called like low side or high side. Um, so here, if you imagine that your microcontroller can't go, like, doesn't have like a negative voltage source, which will generally be the case, especially if I'm doing a sort of one bread board, it's all grounded to the same ground. Um, you will never be able to turn this on uh, if this was at 5 volts, because your microcontroller can only supply 5 volts. Yeah. Um, they're also really controlled by current and not by voltage, although it's, as far as on or off, it's easier to think of it as voltage, not current. Um, and so these resistors are sort of in there to limit the current that goes into the base to prevent them from like exploding. Because if you give them too much current, they'll get really hot and explode. That's obviously bad. Um, these things in here, these diodes, are super important. And our chips actually have them built in, I believe. And so what these are for is, as you guys know, if you have a motor and it's spinning, it's, and you disconnect everything, it's going to start to build up the voltage across the little uh, leads, yeah. That, you know, you guys all remember this from Botcon. And so the bad thing that will happen there is that it, the voltage has to go somewhere. And it can be high voltage, it can act as an inductor, so it's coils in there. And so to prevent killing your transistors by sending voltage through them backwards when they're turned off, uh, you have these diodes that sort of like let current out. And so they, that's good. Um, they're protection diodes. Uh, I guess an example of this is for our for our Poe project, we have these arms moving back and forth. And we were supplying them something like 5 volts at a, a few amps. And by and when we turned it off, there'd be like a 20 volt spike or like a 30 volt spike. Um, and that would just totally fry whatever we had connected to. So we had to throw in some protection uh, diodes, which prevented us from killing everything. Um, so this is sort of what we'll have next week. And we'll be hooking up. Yeah. You can do PWM with these, so you can get one of the motor variable speeds and directions, which is super nice. Um, all right. So that's. This is the H bridge. We learned a little bit about transistors. You can use transistors to turn on and off big things. Um, but for that, I'd recommend actually a FET. You can read more about those sometime other than yeah. Because they're pretty magical. Um, but they have lots of sort of problems that PGTs have. So you talked about sending your signal to a transducer, right? So what's a transducer do? Um, it converts. Electrical signal to some other thing. Yeah, so transducer just generally changes one sort of signal or form of energy into another, right? So, like, you could have an LED, right? So that turns electrical energy into light. You have a motor, right? So that turns the electrical energy into mechanical sort of movement. Or you could have like a heat transducer. I mean, it's not a oh, you get a speaker, right? Um, so, this diagram, why didn't this diagram um, 
So you guys can just read about it if you want later, and I'll tell you about it right now. So there are these things called relays, right? And they do exactly what it sounds like on packet. They relay a signal from one circuit to another circuit and keep those circuits electrically isolated. So, uh, you, you guys ever like seen a relay or heard like the relay's broken or something? Okay, that's maybe a few people. So, if you imagine that you have your, your light bulbs, right? Just like a regular sort of light bulb, and it's operating in like, you know, 112 volts AC or 110 AC, right? And you have your microcontroller. If you plug your microcontroller into the, you know, wall current, it would probably just like get really hot and explode, right? Or melt. And it's very bright. That would be that. Yeah? Maybe? Yeah. yeah. It would probably be that. Also, like, you know, all the pins would be exposed and you touch it and you get zapped. I saw someone do that once. <laughs> he was not pleased. So don't go around, like, sticking your finger in the wall or anything. Um, yeah. But we have these handy things called relays, and they are told, they, they totally isolate the two circuits, but they allow control from one circuit to the other one. So the way that they, you know, they still work in some cases, but the way that they used to work was they used to be built is you literally have a switch. Right? For your sort of like high power circuit, right? So maybe your lights or your whatever. And you would have an electromagnet, and the electromagnet would basically just like, you turn it on, it would push down on the switch, and the switch would be closed. And that's how they work. And I think that's like amusing. They have like this mechanical system, like this mechanical linkage in between these, or electromechanical linkage in between these two circuits. But it was really awesome because you have your electromagnet operating on like 5 volts DC or something like that, and your um, other circuit could be operating on like, you know, anything. It could be 12 volts you know, DC, it could be 24 volts DC, it could be AC current, because it's just literally like a wire that's being closed. Um, so that's really cool. But we live in the future now, and moving parts are sort of being phased out, right? Relays would be expensive to make, you'd imagine, because you have to like wind the coil, and then you gotta like put the thing together so that it doesn't, so that like actually it moves inside of the coil. And you have to have like the switch, and you have to like actually make it work thousands of times. And if you imagine that you try to send a PWM signal through a electromechanical system, you would have some sort of like badness, right? You would have some sort of like, um, it would act sort of like a filter, but it would be not what you wanted, right? So it'd be like driving like 10 kilohertz, and maybe it can only do 10 hertz, and now it's just sort of randomly turning on and off. And that's less good, right? So in the, you know, in the name of making things cheaper, more reliable, and also faster, they're now solid state relays. And they work sort of the, sort of the same way. They have, they have a transducer in them, they have an LED, a photodiode, <laughs> and literally all, of it, all that's in there is there's an LED next to a photodiode, right, like this, inside of a box, you know, it's like a little IC package, they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, but basically there's just a little piece of plastic inside of there, there's an LED and a, you know, a sensor, and when you put, you know, 5 volts at 20 milliamps through the, through one side, it turns on the LED and the thing picks it up and turns on a couple of FETs or some arrangement of FETs. There are many different arrangements. And that connects to the other side of the So they're still totally isolated, um, but they have like this sort of like ghetto like light in a box next to a sensor thing going on. Like when I first thought of when I first heard about this, I thought they were kidding. So it's like that there's that's why it's dumb. But it turns out it's really, really awesome. Side note, um, Revo Electrical Subteam, that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, and so this is this is better than, say, sticking, you know, a $5 op-amp in there, right? You can have your, like, $3 opto-isolator, and it'll actually be completely electrically, like, disconnected. So it's better than an op-amp for buffering in some cases. Um, op-amps, you guys know about them. There are many different things you can do with them. I'm not sure that they totally isolate the two signals, or like, uh, they're, not, they're certainly not electrically disconnected, right? 
things to like realize they're on two totally separate uh, circuits, which is awesome. Okay, so we talked about relays, we talked about transistors, moving big things with the small things, like your microcontrollers. Um, we've got some practice with those soon enough with your motors. And uh, yeah, so now we'll go on to do, talk about interrupts a little bit. Useful things you can do with interrupts. Um, we'll look at some code, which I've put, in, I've put in the guide for you guys. And then we'll talk about how you could use interrupts and why you probably will find it kind of a pain to use interrupts if you're using a secret knowledge or um, this